I believe it's time to start. Uh, my name is Jim Johnston. It is uh, indeed my honor to introduce uh, the presenter of this tutorial this afternoon, Dr. Jerry Schoen. In 1984, I was on the faculty at the University of Florida. I was working with, uh, on a contract with the state, the contract was in force, to develop a certification exam for the state. And I had a telephone conversation with this guy named Jerry Schoen, I never heard of. And uh, he was being considered for, and eventually took the job as the senior behavior analyst for the Developmental Services Program Office in Tallahassee, uh, the first they'd ever had, possibly the first in the nation, I don't know, uh, and held that job for uh, six years. And uh, during that period of time, uh, I was pleased to work very closely with Jerry and uh, helping to develop the state certification program, which uh, got substantially underway during that period of time. Uh, subsequently, uh, Jerry uh, pretty much had his fill of working for the state. A few of you may appreciate what that means. Uh, and uh, quit and started doing consulting. For some years, did uh, consulting work. But meanwhile, the certification program was continuing to evolve. Uh, and uh, other states were saying, me too, we want to do that, can we use your exam, and so forth. And after a while, the state of Florida figured out that, you know, this is not what we signed up for. Uh, and I will let Jerry continue the story of how the, uh, uh, a state-run professional certification program became a freestanding, independent, nonprofit corporation uh, serving the entire field. Uh, Jerry's work in certification is certainly not the only thing he's done, but it is what's brought him his fame or notoriety, depending on one's point of view. Um, Jerry has uh, appropriately won at least one, I think, two uh, service awards from ABBA over the years. Uh, as an ex excellent example of a career built outside of being an academic or being a practitioner. He has very few skills at all. Uh, but the ones he has are very valuable skills. Uh, and I will let him uh, tell you more about them and where he's been and some of the things he's learned along the way. And pay close attention. And please introduce my friend Dr. Richard. Uh, thanks so much, Jim. I won't uh, tell the folks what I've learned about you over the last 25 years. Uh, uh, Jim and I have worked very close for, closely for 25 years, and not many people can say that, and it's been uh, my great honor. Jim mentioned that uh, when I made that phone call to him uh, that he had never heard of me, but I had certainly heard of him, and uh, my throat went dry, and I could barely speak, and uh, the thought of talking to Jim Johnston was a, uh, uh, something that uh, I thought had never occurred to me in my life, so it's been an honor to be uh, affiliated with Jim for the last 25 years. Um, I'm going to do a couple of things here today, and, and Bill asked me to, to talk to uh, people coming into the field, uh, give them an idea of what the field is all about and what some of the career opportunities are in the field, and also talk to uh, folks, uh, EAB folks, squab folks, uh, about some of the things the board's doing and, and how we might move forward together, because I feel uh, coming from a fairly experimental background at Western Michigan and my undergraduate and master's work, uh, I feel uh, I understand the value uh, of EAB, uh, and I think that uh, hopefully what's going to happen is that uh, the rise in behavior analysis in the practitioner level uh, is going to float all boats. And I'm really hoping that uh, we'll be able to come up with ways to uh, make it uh, as attractive uh, for EAB folks as it is for practitioners to be a behavior analyst and to uh, say and be proud of, of certification and credentialing. Uh, behavior analysis is an exciting field and career to have. Uh, when I was going to undergraduate school at Western Michigan, I was uh, online to be a dentist and uh, took a course from uh, Don Willey and, and Dick Malott and just never looked back. It was one of those things that uh, was very exciting for me uh, because uh, I, I had a fairly heavy science background 
And I found a way to be able to mesh science with helping people. And that turned out to be uh, a combination that was uh, very attractive to me, and I think uh, for, most, for many people it might be. Uh, in terms of jobs availability, that varies on what you're going to do. Uh, for folks coming into the field, uh, you'll have a choice of a number of different uh, areas of behavior analysis that I'll go through in a minute. But it kind of depends on where you are going. Right now, for example, uh, what's hot for the practitioner is working uh, with people with autism. Uh, now, that is something right now that uh, about 50% of the folks who are certified do. But as I'll show you later, there are a lot of folks who don't do that right now. Um, if you want to have, uh, if you want to be a practitioner with kids with autism, the job market is is, is very good right now. Uh, if you want to do something else, the job market may not be as well. If you're going to college teaching, for example, uh, clearly uh, the positions that are available at the college teaching level are significantly less than they are for practitioners. Uh, the same thing holds true for job earnings. Uh, although uh, behavior analysts these days can certainly make a good living, uh, it's like the rest of life, you have to make some choices. And uh, if you want to go into college teaching, you may not make as top dollar as someone who is uh, some sort of a practitioner administrator running a program, but there are a lot of other rewards in, uh, rewards in college teaching. I, co I was in college teaching for a number of years, and uh, there are many days when I wish that I had the, uh, the freedom. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the notion of a sabbatical to me is just really a wonderful kind of thing. I just uh, uh, I wish that uh, the board would give me a sabbatical, even for a week or two would be great. Uh, and the lifestyle varies a great deal, too. If you're an administrator, if you do the kind of thing that I do uh, in terms of presentations and everything, you're on the road a lot, uh, you're meeting a lot of people, uh, that has its own rewards. But, uh, again, if you use a college teaching, for example, uh, example, uh, you have a lot of flexibility in your life that, you, that I simply don't have. Uh, you can choose what you want to do more than what I can do. So there is, in life in general, there are trade-offs. Uh, but all of the things in behavior analysis that I've done, uh, whether it be a practitioner, whether it be an administrator, whether it be college teaching, uh, all has its unique rewards. And uh, it's uh, certainly not the least of which is to be able to uh, deal with a lot of people who are really well-versed in what they do and really care a lot about it. And there are not a lot of occupations you can, really talk, you can say that that's true on. Um, there are multiple career areas within uh, the occupation. For example, uh, experimental analysis of behavior, uh, where I started, uh, stems from basic research. Uh, we're looking at basic research here. Uh, it's a scientific foundation for the field. It's what everything else that practitioners, other people do, is built on. Uh, I think that it's a terrific to, to see uh, talks like uh, Michael did where you're trying to bridge the gap between the two. It's not easy for practitioners to keep up on what's going on. We need to have somebody do the translation, I think, for us in many respects because we're not capable of doing it ourselves in many instances. Uh, but folks in EAB discover new aspects of behavior, and, and whenever you discover something new, that turns out to be really exciting and really rewarding. Uh, they also teach uh, EAB to new profession professionals. As we go through these careers, I'm going to look at what professional credentials required and what kind of, what kind of certification uh, or degree is required. Uh, in EAB, uh, the professional credential is not required. Uh, you can do the experimental analysis of behavior without having the practitioner certification. Uh, call yourself a behavior analyst, uh, do whatever. Uh, it's not the kind of situation where the, the uh, certificate is required. Usually, in order to be in, in EAB, uh, you need to have a PhD. So you have to make a commitment to the field. You have to make a commitment to doing that, uh, which will cost you in terms of time and money but the reality is that the end result uh, is worth it. Uh, usually, uh, folks in EAB have professional careers in research, either at a private research institute or more likely at a university. Um, most folks are university faculty uh, and do teaching and research both within that context. Um, one of the things I think the board's looking at right now uh, is how to integrate EAB to into what we're doing. And we have some constraints on that. There are certain things we have to do to follow case law, to follow the standards, to maintain our accreditation that puts some boundaries on that. But I think we can be pretty creative about things. And I'll show you a little bit later and talk a little bit about that more later. 
Uh, there's also the conceptual and theoretical branch. Uh, again, it, these folks form the uh, theoretical foundation for the field. Uh, they often teach these concepts to new professionals. Uh, often these folks seem to have got their start in EAB. Uh, not always, but it seems like most of them have. Uh, professional credential is not required. Again, it's not one of the. Uh, it's not a, uh, a practitioner-based sort of thing. It's not required. Uh, usually, folks in this area, and this is a relatively small group of individuals compared to, for example, practitioners or EAB or ABA people. Uh, usually, PhD people, uh, and usually these folks are in university faculty. Uh, another aspect of behavior analysis uh, that can serve as a career is applied behavior analysis. This is probably the one where uh, most of the folks in the uh, uh, applied track will end up. Uh, applied knowledge from EAB to human behavior. We take the, what we've learned from basic research uh, and then put that within a human context. Uh, these folks discover new ways to use uh, essentially applied behavior analysis to help other people. It's more of an applied sort of situation than it is research for research sake or just to discover new kinds of things. Um, they also teach ABA to new professionals. Uh, not, again, not a uh, credential required, uh, but usually these folks have PhDs. And their professional careers are uh, research, again, either in a private or university environment, usually the latter. Uh, or university faculty, and then doing teaching and research within that position. And I kind of break out practitioners as out from applied behavior analysis. Applied behavior analysis, for our purposes here, will be folks who do college teaching, who do research in, in ABA, uh, folks who actually do the application in uh, clinical environments uh, we'll call behavior analyst practitioners. Uh, these folks use the knowledge that's built, that uh, comes from EAB and ABA, the practitioner, for the, uh, excuse me, the uh, researchers that have uh, gone before us there to help people. They translate things all the way from the lab all the way up into working with people per se. Uh, practitioners work with a wide range of clients, and I'm going to describe to you what the most common uh, populations are uh, for the folks that we certify. And these folks can either work in a program uh, that may be uh, an institution, it may be uh, a, a, some sort of a freestanding living environment, uh, it can be a, a clinic, uh, or they, they can uh, work privately. They can be just private vendors that have a client base. Uh, often with practitioners, uh, a credential is required. Uh, not always, but often, and usually it's a good idea to have one even if it's not required. It helps you uh, as a uh, practitioner. Uh, this has a broader base in terms of degrees that people have. It goes all the way from a bachelor's degree all the way up to a PhD. Uh, so the thing about being a practitioner in applied behavior analysis is that if you stop at a bachelor's level, uh, then chances are, particularly if you're certified, you'll be able to find a, a career that is matched at that level. If you have a master's degree, also you'll find a career, that, a career that's at that level. Um, in terms of professional careers, usually uh, a lot of uh, practitioners do direct intervention with clients. Uh, we do things a little bit differently than uh, other professions do and that we don't have people come into our office. We go out into the field, into the natural environment, and uh, do the work there. Uh, some people are in supervision of the people who are doing the actual uh, applied work, and some folks are in administration. So there are different career opportunities uh, within a practitioner environment. Um, do practitioners, what, what practitioners really do need to have credentialing? Here's some examples of some that do and some that don't. Uh, there's a part of applied behavior analysis called organizational behavior management. Uh, these folks go and work in business and industry kinds of settings. Uh, they use the uh, uh, principles of behavior with employees of the, uh, uh, either the uh, factory or the business that they go into. Uh, and they usually work on areas like improving the quality of the job that's being done, the product that's being done, uh, the amount of production that's, uh, that's available, uh, or safety. Safety is a big uh, area right now in organizational behavior management. So essentially they use, again, the principles of behavior to help people within a business environment. Uh, but they don't need to have credentials. Uh, they're, they, uh, they're in an area where people look at what they've done, 
they make their judgment based on that rather than the credentials that they have. Uh, in the area of helping professions, uh, folks there work in various kinds of clinical practices, and we'll talk about that again in a few minutes. Uh, direct inter intervention with clients, again, uh, supervision and administration, uh, and the professional credential there, again, is uh, usually helpful, often required. We're finding that there's more and more requirement for that. Uh, and those folks are typically board-certified behavior analysts or assistant behavior analysts. Uh, here are the areas, the most uh, frequent areas that we find uh, uh, certificates working. They, they uh, say their job titles, uh, number one is behavior analyst. And this is a good, a good thing, that people are called, over 50% of the, the folks who are certified are called behavior analysts. They're not called psychologists, they're not called anything else, they're called behavior analysts. Uh, then you can see that it kind of goes down, consulting trainer, professional or academic. Many professors, particularly folks who are teaching um, ABA classes, they're preparing people for, for certification, although they don't need to have uh, certification to teach the classes, many choose to get it as an example to other people. Uh, I've been surprised at the number of people who have uh, uh, clearly are at the pinnacle of their careers. They don't have to get certification, but they do because uh, they have teaching students that are going to become certified. They want to provide a good example. Uh, the next thing down, administrators, uh, psychologists. Many psychologists who are also licensed, are licensed psychologists also have become certificates in applied behavior analysis. Uh, I think this is a good sign because I think that what that means is that individuals that may have not had adequate behavioral training in their psychology program become a psychologist look to us now to uh, provide uh, an additional credential indicating that they have um, skills in, in behavior analysis. Also, uh, school teacher and researcher. Uh, that was an interesting one to me as well because Clearly, researchers do not have to have any sort of a credential in order to practice. Many of them choose to do so. My guess is that these folks are probably researchers in applied behavior analysis. We don't have any way to tease out the data on really uh, uh, if there are any EAB folks there or not. But uh, they've, again, they've said, I'm teaching people who uh, are going to become certified, therefore it's a good idea for me to become certified. Uh, what kind of client populations do our, our folks work in? Um, autism is number one, other developmental disabilities, but then you can see there's a really a pretty wide range of areas in which people can work. And of course the advantage to someone coming into the field is that they've got a lot of choices now. Uh, generally speaking, people look at uh, one area, they try maybe two or three different areas, they kind of hone in on one area that uh, is best for them, but uh, there are a lot of choices. Um, so when behavior analysts need to have some sort of a credential, uh, typically they, choose, they uh, go to the board for that. Uh, we're a nonprofit corporation. Uh, it's a, not a membership organization. We essentially provide a service. Uh, we credential individuals who meet our criteria. Uh, we founded the organization in uh, 1998, but again, as Jim says, uh, it really came out of the state of Florida program. Uh, Florida had a well-developed examination. Uh, and it, what I've learned, and, I, and Jim helped me understand this, and I, and I was not trained in, in test construction coming into this position, but, but what I learned was that there's a whole body of case law. Uh, you might imagine that when someone uh, is controlled as to how much of a living they can make, as to whether they have a credential or not, then if someone fails the examination, then they're often not happy and uh, that may uh, result in them uh, suing the board for one reason or another. Uh, so one of the things you've got to do when you're running the program is you have to not only be able to have the examination, you know, separate those who know from those who don't know, but you also have to place equal importance on making sure that the program is consistent with case law and with standards for the field. Because if you end up in court uh, and someone finds cracks in your program, uh, then the whole program could go under. So we've been very careful about making sure that we follow all the case law and all the appropriate standards. Uh, the program is endorsed but independent from uh, ABAI, uh, Division 25 of the American Psychological Association, uh, the Association of Professional Behavior Analysts, and this last year, the European Association for Behavior Analysis. 
One of the things that we're, we're trying to do uh, outside the United States is sort of is unite the field. Uh, what happens in many uh, professions, uh, take for example medicine, is if you become a physician, say, in uh, 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 South America somewhere and you move to the United States, usually there's not reciprocity. Usually you have to be, go through other coursework, maybe take another examination, or uh, go to New York City and drive a cab or something. And it's because you, don't, you can't use that, what, that uh, license in the United States. Uh, we're trying to avoid that. We've got a big advantage because being a science of behavior, uh, there's no disagreement between uh, Warsaw or Dublin or uh, Tallahassee or San Francisco as to what reinforcement is. I mean, everybody knows what that is. It's the same everywhere. So we have an advantage in that it's not what people think or what the culture tells you to do in situations like that. It's a, it's, it's a science, and so we have things that everyone agrees on. And when we go through the process of determining what should be on the exam, and I'll talk about that too in a minute, uh, what we see is a really, really, really high level of agreement between people. We don't see groups splintered on things. Uh, the, the one area that we'll probably have to look at very closely for outside the United States uh, is the area of ethics because the, the social situation in different countries will probably lead us to having different sorts of questions and standards in the, in the area of, of ethics. But other than that, uh, the science is a science and everybody agrees on it. So we'll have a, people will be able to get certified in Warsaw and move to Dublin if they wish to do so and have the same credential. There will not, not be a problem doing that. I think that gives the field a big advantage because any time you have mobility like that and you can move people around and, uh, as easily as that, uh, I think that's an advantage over people who can't do that sort of thing and I think we can. Uh, one of the things that we did was become accredited by, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the National Council for Certifying Agencies. Uh, that's a national organization, as the uh, name implies. Uh, we had to go through a lengthy uh, procedure to get our certification programs accredited. But again, what that does is give us an advantage if we're talking to uh, state legislators uh, or anyone who wants to know about the quality of the program. What this simply says to them is, yeah, this is a legit program. Uh, it's a robust program. Uh, it's one that meets all the standards uh, of uh, certification. So that's something that's very important to us. Um, we have out, we've contracted for outside services, for examination development, uh, and for job task analysis and translation. Uh, we're at the situation right now. We'll, we'll be looking at our board meeting on Wednesday at whether we want to translate the examination into Spanish. Uh, we have people from Spain who said, yeah, we'll provide money to do that and we'll provide uh, person power to make sure that that gets done correctly. Uh, and the other language right now we have money for is, is Chinese. Uh, we've been, we have money to do that translation and, and, and person power to help us do that right now. So we'll be looking at that sort of thing. But the person in the company who does the examination for us uh, also does examination services for other professions and does licensure examinations. And they do the same thing for us as they would for licensing examinations. It's exactly the same process. They do exactly the same things. Um, the other contracting service that we have, contracted services we have, is, is Pearson View uh, out of Minneapolis. Uh, they, they do worldwide secure computer-based testing examination administration. Uh, they have very high secure kinds of environments and they have a number of different clients. We're actually a very small client compared to some of their clients, for example, Microsoft. Uh, but what that means is if you go in to take the examination, uh, it'll be the same environment wherever you go. The, the environment will be consistent. And you, you may be sitting next to someone who's doing an IT exam for Microsoft or sitting next to someone who's doing a medical specialty examination. Uh, but what that kind of underscores is that when it comes to the area of professional credentialing, it's pretty much the same between professions. There really aren't any differences. It's all done, the exams are built the same way. It's all done the same way. Uh, we have over 200 uh, testing sites in the United States and 150 uh, outside the United States. Um, so that means that uh, people can really test virtually in any country in the world right now. Um, we have uh, three four-week windows a year where you sign up and you take the examination during that time. Uh, it's done at your convenience uh, when it's good for you. 
Uh, here are the data uh, on cumulative number of certificates. Uh, you can see that it's, it, it's just gone up every year. Uh, it's the kind of thing that, uh, that we like to see. That means the field is growing. Uh, one of the things that we'll be doing uh, in, the, in the board of directors meeting, uh, as we have done in virtually every meeting, is looked at raising the bar for certification. Uh, we had to start out at a given level because the contract we had with Florida to give us the examination specified we had to do what Florida was doing. So the starting point was pretty well defined by, by, by Florida. But what we've done uh, every year since then is in one way or the other raise the bar to raise the quality of people, the amount of education that's required, uh, the, the kind of supervision that's required, who can supervise, uh, all of those kinds of things, we keep raising the criteria on. Now, since we're dealing with the university environments uh, in terms of the training, uh, we have to be careful uh, that we don't uh, put too much pressure on the universities and, and raise the bar too quickly. Uh, but usually what happens is that the universities are glad to see that happen. Uh, although it may cause them some hardships, as it turns out, uh, most people can figure out how to add an extra behavior analysis class and usually they don't find that uh, an aversive event. Uh, usually uh, behavior analysts would prefer to have more behavioral training within their department. So we're trying to provide a mechanism here as part of certification uh, of providing opportunities for uh, behavior analysis to grow. And I think that uh, having EAB be part of that certainly is something we're interested in. Uh, there are a number of, of, the, of courses right now uh, that can be taught within an EAB framework that we approve. For example, the basic principles course, uh, that can be taught easily within uh, an EAB framework and that we allow that to happen. Uh, we have a discretionary course, a 45-hour graduate discretionary course that can be used in any area of behavior analysis. And individuals can uh, choose to do an EAB course as their discretionary area. Uh, about half of the content for the examination uh, can be done, for example, within an EAB framework. Uh, if you look at things like experimental design sorts of things, well, that's pretty consistent. Uh, if you look at the measurement of behavior, that's pretty consistent. So there may be a tweaks that will be need to, to be made somewhere along the line so that people understand how to apply these things to a human population. Uh, but we encourage universities to uh, uh, make EAB a part of what they're doing. And I think that down the road you'll see that that's going to increase and the contingencies probably will increase as well. Uh, here are the data for out of the United States certificates. Uh, the dark, by the way, is for board certified behavior analysts. The light color is for assistant. Uh, behavior analyst. In order to be a board certified behavior analyst, you have to have a, a master's degree or a PhD. Uh, you have to graduate coursework. Uh, you've got to have uh, supervised experience and you've got to take the exam. Uh, but about 5% right now of our certificate base uh, is outside the United States. Um, and we're working to help uh, universities and individuals outside the United States. Uh, build university courses that are uh, going to enable people to take uh, uh, the examination. Uh, one of the advantages, I think, of having uh, one of our approved course sequences is that essentially we go through and make sure that you have everything that the field has said is necessary. So one of the things we found when we first started out was that universities often would have gaps in some of the things that they were teaching. And that was largely a function of uh, university professors tending to teach what they knew and what they liked. And if part of that was not, if you didn't particularly like a particular area, then sometimes that didn't get co covered in the curriculum. So one of the things we do is make sure that everybody knows what they need to know, or at least they're exposed to it, uh, which I think is a pretty important sort of thing. I remember several years ago that uh, at Western Michigan we were trying to get a curriculum project going, uh, and Dick Mallott was spearheading that, and uh, it just didn't wash. Uh, the, the faculty were not interested in going through the process to make sure everything was taught and, and whatever. Uh, this uh, hopefully is not too onerous, but will result in the same end. Uh, we approve university training at uh, all of our certification levels. Uh, that doesn't, we don't, do not accredit programs. ABBA does that. 
uh, what we do is approve the coursework as meeting our standards. And essentially what happens is that people send in the syllabi for their courses. Uh, they send in their CVs. Uh, we look at the syllabi and make sure that uh, all the content that we need to have covered is covered within the courses. And then we approve the courses. And uh, that gives the students going through some assurance that if they take these courses, they'll meet the coursework requirement for the examination. Uh, and also gives faculty that kind of assurance as well. They don't want to teach a course and then have it rejected out of hand later. Um, we have both U.S. and non-U.S. universities right now. Uh, we've got uh, over 175 universities that have approved course sequences. And uh, those of you who are approximately my, my age may recall that uh, about 10 or 12 years ago, uh, the field was not in the position that it is now. Uh, 10 or 12 years ago, probably a number of people would not have guessed that we would have nearly 200 universities that would be able to teach five uh, graduate courses in behavior analysis. But it, it, that's the case right now. About 33 of these uh, programs are outside the United States. Uh, and that's been a pretty big growth just within the last five or six years. Uh, we have both on-campus and distance learning courses. Um, I was, I have to say, and I think Jim would probably feel the same way, when we first started talking about the acceptance of distance learning courses, uh, we weren't particularly happy with that. Uh, you generally like to have the idea that there are folks on site doing things uh, and they're face to face interaction or whatever. Uh, what we found, and I, and I understand this is a pretty narrow uh, thing to look at, but what we found is that the test scores uh, for the uh, university programs taught distance learning uh, are virtually the same as those for on campus courses. Uh, some of the distance learning courses right now have turned out to really be uh, excellent uh, instructional technology, I think, uh, and uh, uh, will remain with uh, distance learning courses as well because one of the things that allows us to do is to provide worldwide training. It's no longer the case that someone in Ethiopia says, I don't have a university near me teaching behavior analysis. Uh, we have about, I think, 25 now uh, core, core sequences that have been approved in the area of distance learning. So essentially, anybody anywhere in the world can get the instruction that they need to have. Uh, we also approved university experience, and we say that university faculty or people who are board certified have to do the supervision uh, of, the, of the experience. And this, again, uh, thanks to technology, can be done worldwide. Uh, you can have video cams that you use and observe people in the, in the uh, uh, natural environment uh, real time, uh, implementing procedures, provide feedback to them or whatever. Uh, I think that probably most of us would want to be able to have that happen face-to-face uh, um, -face as opposed to electronically. But again, this provides an opportunity for individuals to get experience anywhere in the world. So the training can be got anywhere in the world, the experience can be got anywhere in the world, and because of the, the testing network that we have, uh, we can uh, test people virtually anywhere in the world. Uh, and I think this gives the field a reach that maybe it didn't have before. Uh, I think that, that in the past we were pretty much limited to the universities that we had uh, on campus. Uh, that's no longer the case. There are a lot more people now that are, are learning behavior analysis than they ever have in the past. Uh, but the fact that they go through the approved course sequences uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to pass the examination. Uh, only about 75% of the people who qualify to take the BCBA examinations pass. And uh, that's even at a lower level for the assistant levels. So uh, the, the folks that we're certifying now are not people who just kind of breeze through some coursework. And we know that the coursework was of at least a reasonable quality if the people can take and pass the examinations. So we have some sort of a, uh, maybe not the preferred bottom line uh, uh, measurement, but we do have something that allows us to compare across uh, universities and, and we see that people have indeed different rate pass rates based on the quality of the, of the programs. Uh, about 90% of the university, of the people taking the examinations come out of one of these approved universities. And here are the data on, on cumulative number of universities. Actually, like a master's program of 
I guess the question was, do you have any comparison between people who went through a master's program and the people who, who just took the coursework? No, we don't have those data. Uh -uh. Well, that's a good question, and it's something that we're going to be looking at. I, well, I should mention to you that as a function of raising the bar all the time, the eventual goal is going to be, ha is going to be that people will be in master's programs, uh, our, I mean, our, in behavior analysis. It's our hope that we'll keep raising the coursework, and all of a sudden the universities will look around and say, well, we could have a master's. We have enough courses to have a master's program here. And, and then they'll kind of feed into that. We've already seen a number of new PhD programs that have been developed because they kind of taken, they've, they've got the master's level work up to a point where uh, they can go to their administration and say, we, we need to move to the next level. We have a need here. We have, uh, you know, the, uh, the coursework is, is needed. So we don't have those data, uh, but I, I kind of get from your question, you would expect that people would come, coming out of a master's program would probably have a higher pass weight. Uh, I don't have the data. My general notion is that that although we might think that they do, I, I'm, not, I'm just not sure that they do. Ninety percent come from from approved course sequences now, but they may not. They may just be the the five courses that are required. But that's it's not a master's program. Um, here are the, the non-U.S. universities, and you can see again that that's growing fairly substantially as well. And, and regardless of where we are in behavior analysis, uh, EAB, uh, conceptual, whatever, I think this is good news. Uh, I think what this means is that we're doing a lot more training than we have in the past. A lot more people are learning behavior analysis than what they have in the past. Uh, and again, I'm, what I'm hoping is that we're going to find ways to work together so that uh, this, the tide uh, raise, does raise all boats and that we'll be able to parlay this into uh, a more robust field than perhaps we, we thought we could have a few years ago. Um, this is sort of interesting to me because I always assumed this, th these are the course sequences where, in which department are the course sequences housed? Uh, and, and I expected that uh, all of the course sequences, or a lot of them, would be in psychology departments, but that's not true. Uh, what's happened is, and I think maybe a lot of this has to do with autism and the need for people to work with kids in autism in educational environments, but, but what we see is that education departments are, are the highest. It's not psychology. Psychology is next, uh, then counseling, then the infamous other, uh, the behavior analysis departments. There are a few behavior analysis departments. We're hoping that's going to increase a lot uh, over time. Uh, we have a few in, in uh, departments of medicine, uh, in sociology, and in the generic human services sort of area. So one of the things that, that we have contended over the last few years is that, that behavior analysis really is not a part of psychology. Uh, the behavior analysis is a freestanding field, and it's ev is evidenced by the fact that it's taught across a number of different departments. Um, and I think what that does is, to a certain extent, for at least for practitioners, uh, is to free them from uh, having to uh, be supervised or uh, uh, be, be looked over in any capacity uh, by licensed psychologists or other professionals that may not have any training in behavior analysis. Uh, so now what we're simply saying is that we're, our supervision needs to be provided by board certified behavior analysts. Uh, although psychologists in some states can do, uh, in most states can do behavior analysis as a function of their licensure, uh, we're a freestanding uh, field. Yeah, they'll fall. In, it, it, she, the, the question is, in some states, yeah, they they still fall under. Uh, yeah, in in some states, in Texas, uh, for example, uh, uh, behavior analysts still fall under psychologists, and I'm sure that's going to make be be true for a number of years. But I think what we're seeing now is through uh, being able to use some of the the clout we now have uh, in terms of autism treatment that that's going to decrease over time. Uh, we're seeing in a number of states now where, uh, for example, uh, behavior analysts are written into the law, uh, per se, and board-certified behavior analysts are written into the law. There are 22 states now that have uh, uh, legislation that's been passed 
uh, for insurance for individuals with autism. And although, as you can see, uh, the bulk of our folks did not come, don't serve people with autism, uh, that's turned out to be a, a good inroad, I think, for the field. Uh, it's one of those kind of situations where we wouldn't necessarily choose to have an emphasis in autism. If we, if we were dealing our cards, we would say we'd like to have it across the board. Uh, to a certain extent, we, can't, we really can't control that now. Uh, we, have to we have to look for the opportunities that are available for us. Eventually, down the road, I think what's going to happen is that people, for example, will see that there was a big push to have folks who uh, had uh, ABA skills working with kids with autism. They'll say, okay, what about my kid? My kid's a normal kid that stutters. You know, uh, can, can you help me as well? Uh, and I think that, that that's something we need to push for, but, but quite frankly, although I'm, I'm sure, certainly sensitive to the notion that uh, you know, we don't want to have all of our eggs in the autism basket, uh, we don't have as much of a choice maybe as, as, as what we would like to have in that regard. And then the question I have is, well, what's the alternative? I mean, do we not work with kids with autism? Do we not take this kind of uh, opportunity to have the field grow as much as it has? Uh, do we turn our backs on that kind of thing? And I, I don't think anybody wants that. Um, so in order to maintain and require certification, uh, again, we have certification at two levels. You have to have a degree. You have to have coursework, you have to have uh, supervised professional experience, and you have to have the examination, pass the examination. Um, we, as many professions, we also say you have to have continuing education. And the continuing education can be in any kind of behavior analysis. So people can take uh, their continuing educations in uh, uh, EAB or whatever they choose to take it in. Uh, the, uh, for example, when I go to the European Association meeting, they typically have two tracks. They'll have an applied track and they'll have a EAB track. So I'll occasionally go over and, and, uh, and do the EAB track. I have to confess that uh, I haven't kept up with it as, as I should, and so there are certain things I, I don't understand. But still, it's fun to go back in and look at it. Uh, but we, we maintain that people either uh, do continuing education to maintain uh, their status or to uh, retake the examination. That one's a real low choice kind of option. <laughs> I would never do that. Um, let me quickly tell you about how we build the, the, the content for the examination. Uh, uh, we form what's called a task list, and that's a list of all the skills that are required, and that's what we build the examination on. Uh, we run a job task analysis uh, every few years, every five to ten years, to make sure that the content we have is current with the field. Uh, the field is surveyed on the importance of uh, the task to being an entry-level behavior analyst. We ask people who are in the field to tell us uh, what the important things they do are, what some things that are not important. Uh, so we'll not only have uh, practitioners in the field tell us, tell us that, we'll also uh, make it, uh, the survey available to uh, university individuals who are teaching in the, uh, in the, in the course sequences. So, so the field, again, determines what the content of the exam is. It's not uh, Jim and me sitting in, in a basement somewhere saying, we think this ought to be in there. I think Jim and I would disagree with some of the things, for example. We'd like to have more of some things than other things. In it. But it's not my choice. It's not anybody's choice. It's the field's choice. Uh, last time around, we did a fairly big uh, survey. I'm getting ahead of myself. <clears throat> we start out by having a subject matter expert panel where we put uh, essentially 12 experts in a room. Uh, we did this uh, at the California Association meeting a couple years ago. Um, and they look at the existing task list and say, well, this needs to be added, this needs to be subtracted, this needs to be changed. Uh, after they re re uh, review it and revise the task list, then we pilot that, and this time we did uh, 282 uh, individuals in universities and in, in the field uh, to say, this panel get it right. If they did, that's great. If they didn't, tell us what we need to add, subtract, whatever. Uh, and uh, we had 102 people respond. Actually, 36% always disappoints me, but uh, if you do this kind of work, you understand that uh, that's really a pretty high level. Then we go to an international online survey, and we sent it out to uh, 7,000 people and got 22,200 uh, responses. 
So again, you can see that what we do to make sure that the content is still um, uh, appropriate. Uh, we then revise the task list, and here's a sequence of events uh, that takes us a period of up to uh, five years to uh, really put together from beginning to end uh, one of the job task analysis. But we feel that it's important. We have to do this. We have to do this uh, from case law and also from uh, the standards we follow. Oh, by the way, all things, here are some of just examples of the kind of content in the area that we, we test. The things in yellow are the kind of things that can be taught uh, f from an EAB perspective. Um, and to sum up, the, here's, if you want more information on the board, uh, here's where all the information can be had. Uh, it'll tell you everything you want to know and probably more. Uh, one of the important aspects I think we've introduced to the field is the Guidelines for Responsible Conduct which is essentially a code of ethics for behavior analysts. It takes into, into effect how we look at the world and how we treat things. Uh, and also disciplinary standards so that if people do egregiously bad sorts of things that we can uh, put them before this committee and we can uh, do anything from find them to remove their certificate. Uh, okay. okay, thank you very much.